I can honestly say that this is the only colleague with whom I have shared a bedroom for 15 years at one point in my life. Uh, it is a great pleasure to introduce my brother Kenneth. Uh, Father Kenneth Himes is a Franciscan priest of Holy Name Province, that's the East Coast Province of the Franciscans. Uh, he holds a doctorate in religion and public policy from Duke University. Uh, he was 23 years a member of the faculty of the Washington Theological Union and uh, last academic year to my intense pleasure, uh, Boston College uh, invited him to come and join our faculty where he is now a member of the faculty in the theology department and chair of the department as well. Uh, a number of people have asked me what it's like to have my younger brother as my boss. And I always reply that if you know anything about the academic world, you know that being chair of a department is not like being someone's boss, it's like being their valet. Uh, and I remind Kenneth of that regularly. Uh, Kenneth, in the course of his very I can honestly say distinguished career, has written three books. A fourth is coming next summer entitled uh, Modern Catholic Social Teaching, Commentaries and Analysis from uh, Georgetown University Press, uh, and literally dozens of articles in uh, both scholarly and popular journals. Um, some years ago, Kenneth and I wrote a book together uh, fullness of faith, pub the public significance of theology, and we dedicated it to our mother, who was at that time living in New York, on Long Island. And shortly after the book appeared, uh, mother was attending an affair on Long Island at which the local bishop was present, who knew her, and who was reading the book. And he said to her, Mrs. Himes, uh, I trust, of course, you've seen the book that the boys have written and dedicated to you. And mother said, yes, indeed she had. And the bishop then said to her, well, I'm reading it at the moment. Have you read it? And mother said she had. And the bishop said, well, what did you think of it? To which he then told me later, mother replied, it's breakfast table conversation. It's what the two of them talk about when they're both at home for breakfast. Well, I am delighted this evening to welcome you to a little taste of the Himes family breakfast table, my brother Kenneth. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, what Michael didn't mention uh, is that uh, one of the uh, later books that I did, uh, I dedicated to him. And I simply said it was for the privilege and the pleasure of being his brother. Uh, and, that, and that still obtains today. Uh, and although I, uh, it's true, uh, being his chairman is not exactly being his boss, but uh, it's not exactly like being his valet either. Although we do have the dry cleaning in the car, I can give you later on. Uh, uh, the topic, I think I'll move over this way. The, uh, the topic for tonight is uh, what dare we hope for, the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. Uh, let me begin uh, by reading to you a, uh, a passage from a letter of St. Paul. It's a very early statement of the Christian community's faith in the resurrection as well as the consequences that hinge on the truth of that claim, that Jesus is risen. It's chapter uh, 15 of the first letter to the Corinthians. This is a letter written probably somewhere in the very early 50s AD, so within approximately 20 years or so of Jesus' death and resurrection. Paul writes, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, the gospel that you received and in which you are firmly established, because the gospel will save you only if you keep believing exactly what I preached to you. Believing anything else will not lead to anything. Well then, in the first place, I taught you what I had been taught myself. <laughs> 
namely that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised up to life on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, that he appeared first to Cephas, that is Peter, and secondly to the twelve. Next, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me too, though it was as if I was born out of time. I'm going to skip a few verses. Now if Christ raised from the dead is what has been preached, how can some of you be saying that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, Christ himself cannot have been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is useless. Your believing it is useless. Indeed, we are shown up as witnesses who have committed perjury before God because we swore in evidence that God had raised Christ to life. For if the dead are not raised, Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, you are still in your sins. And what is more serious? All who have died in Christ have perished. If our hope in Christ has been for this life only, we are the most pitiable of all people. Tonight, I'd like to do three things. First, I'd like to spend a little time clarifying what resurrection is and is not. Then I would like to explain why I believe the resurrection is the only thing that makes sense of the rise of Christianity. And finally, I'd like to talk a bit about what does it mean for us to say that Jesus has been raised. After all, even if that's true, good for Jesus, we might say. But what does it mean for us that Christ has been raised? And what I'm about to say this evening, I want to acknowledge that I rely a great deal upon several important scholars uh, who have instructed me greatly uh, in what they have written on this topic. There are three biblical scholars in particular who I have found influential on this topic. One is N.T. Wright, who is a, an Anglican bishop, the Bishop of Durham, England, who's also a very fine biblical scholar. Luke Timothy Johnson, a Roman Catholic layman who is a professor of scripture at Emory University in Atlanta. And finally, Joseph Fitzmaier, a Jesuit priest, now retired, who taught for many years at the Catholic University of America and Georgetown University. I also rely upon three theologians, uh, Walter Kaspar, a German Catholic theologian who's now actually the cardinal in charge of ecumenical affairs and interreligious dialogue within uh, the Roman Catholic Church, Elizabeth Johnson, a, uh, a Roman Catholic sister who was a professor of theology at Fordham University, and Karl Rahner, a German Jesuit priest who passed away a number of years ago and who is, I think, uh, in the eyes of many, the most influential Roman Catholic theologian of the past century. So my first topic, what do we mean when we talk about resurrection? What are we talking about when we talk about resurrection? The claim of the resurrection is not simply that Jesus is no longer among the dead. It's also the claim that he now shares in the life and the power of God. There has been a long debate about resurrection and immortality throughout Western history. Too easily, Christians slip into what might be called a Hellenic viewpoint, that is a Greek-influenced viewpoint whereby they understand the afterlife as simply the claim that the soul is immortal. The biblical teaching, the teaching of Paul and others, I'm going to suggest, reflects a different perspective, what we might call a Semitic perspective, a Hebrew worldview. Christian hope 
is not captured by belief in immortality of souls. Beyond the belief that we simply survive somehow beyond death. Rather, the mainstream biblical and Christian view claims, and it may be very hard to kind of get our heads around this claim, but the claim is that we shall live in a new state of embodiedness, for which the best word is resurrection. Resurrection, of course, is not resuscitation. Resuscitation would be the example of someone like Lazarus in the New Testament, or the daughter of Jairus, or the son of the widow at Nain. All of these are examples in the Gospels of people who, return, who will return to life from death. Jesus, however, the claim is, did not return from the dead to continue his former life. That is presumably Lazarus and the daughter of Jairus and the son of the widow with name lived longer but at some point died and died for good. That is not the claim we make about Jesus. Jesus did not simply return from the dead. That would be good news for him, certainly. It would be good news for his family and friends. But it would not mean the new creation. It would not suggest the new age that the first Christians believed had begun because of Jesus' resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus was, for the early Christian community, a claim that Jesus had entered into a new life that was filled with the power and the life of God. So what will happen to us after death? Talk of going to heaven when we die, or being in paradise, is one answer to that question. What happens after death? We go to rest, and we wait in trust for God. But what we are waiting for, you see, is a new world. Heaven by itself, I would suggest to you, is not our final destination. It is a temporary resting place between bodily death and bodily resurrection. The final home is a renewed earth, joined now to a renewed heaven to make a new world. Our final resting place is a new world, a world unlike this world, a world with new dimensions. Just as Jesus' physical existence after the resurrection is a renewed physical life with new dimensions. Resurrection promises that our bodily humanity is to be restored and renewed. Our bodies are not dispensable. They are not simply to be tossed aside at death and of little importance. Rather, the resurrection suggests that our bodies are morally and theologically significant. Our humanity is precious, and we believe that God will bring it out, as it were, in a new edition through the resurrection. How does the resurrection, then, help us understand the rise of Christianity? First, we must understand how contemporaries of Jesus thought about these matters. During Jesus' lifetime, there was, as you may well know, a split within Judaism on the question of resurrection. The Sadducees denied it. The Pharisees believed the entire community of Israel would rise at the end time. Most Jews of Jesus' time following the Pharisees, kept a firm hope that God would visit his people and restore them one day as a great nation. Not by ending the world or by taking the Jewish people off to some other worldly place, but precisely by beginning a new time in this world. The Jewish people also realized in accord with their sense of justice, 
that Yahweh would have to allow the righteous Jews who had lived earlier and died to somehow share in this new time and the benefits of this new age. And so they came to believe that the righteous dead would be restored to life in the end time. In short, what many Jews of Jesus' time believed was that their God would do three things. One, at some point, renew the life of the Jewish nation. Secondly, renew the life of the entire world. And finally, call forth the righteous dead to life and enable them to share in this new world. That last part, the calling forth of the righteous dead, was what the Jewish people believed the term resurrection meant. It was part, you see, of the total package that they hoped for if God was to be faithful to the promise of Israel. Now the biblical scholar N.T. Wright, who I've mentioned I find very convincing on this topic, has suggested the following image. Imagine if you would for a moment you are standing by a river. On one bank of the river is a paved road that runs right up to the shoreline of the river. On the other side of the river is another road, paved road, right up to the shoreline. There is no bridge in sight. On one side of the river is a car. A half hour later, you see the same car now on the other side of the river. How did it get there? No bridge in sight. Well, we are left to develop some hypotheses about how the car got to the other side. There is a ferry that transported the car, a possibility. Perhaps a very strong person threw the car across the river, a possibility. The car is really amphibious, like the duck boats downtown that go into the Charles. And therefore, it simply sailed across the river. Perhaps, very biblically, the river's waters were parted, and the car simply drove across the river. You can think of other options. Now, think of the Jewish community's expectation of what the end time and resurrection meant. And think of that as one side of the, the road. One side of the road is how the Jewish people understood the resurrection and the end time. The road on the other side of the river is how that first generation of Christians believed and lived. How did they get from there to there? What happened? What got them across the river? Now, no matter what school of thought you subscribe to, whether a Pharisee or a Sadducee, you would not have been prepared for Easter. So you see, it took a while, as the Gospels, which came after the writing of Paul, and as their narrative stories indicate, it took a while for the Christian community to make sense of how they got from there to there. The claim that one person, not an entire family of people, but one person has been raised and the end time has begun. First century Judaism talked about resurrection. The early church said, it's happened. Why? What option fits the evidence? Now then, the experience of Easter, the rise of resurrection talk among Christians, means that something must have happened that led them to think the end time had begun. The great renewal that God had promised somehow was beginning. God's reign had now been established, but what 
must that something have been? What would permit sensible men and women who thought that their hopes had been dashed because of the crucifixion to now think that the end time of God's promises had begun in this world. Clearly, the Romans had not packed up and left town. Israel was not liberated. Injustice and oppression still existed. Nothing had seemingly renewed the nation of Israel. The world seemed to be the same as it was before. So what must have happened to Jesus to lead them to think that the world had begun to be transformed? Some might suggest that the disciples came to have a profound sense that God loved them even though they had abandoned Jesus and run away at his arrest. Or perhaps the disciples thought that Jesus had a very good mission and that his work should continue on now without him. Or that Jesus had taught about a spiritual, non-physical kingdom. And after his death, the disciples simply concluded he had gone ahead of them to that place. Well, perhaps most skeptically, perhaps we should simply think they were ignorant, superstitious peasants and fishermen who simply did not understand the laws of nature. The dead don't come back to life. The difficulty you see, of course, is that none of those hypotheses get the car across the river. The word resurrection simply did not mean to first century Jews any of those hypotheses. What resurrection meant was the belief that one who was physically dead was now physically alive. The Jews of Jesus' time had words for forgiveness. They had words for the experience of being loved by God. They had words for continuing the work of a great prophet. They even had words for believing in a supernatural world beyond death. But Jesus' disciples did not use any of those words. They did not use any of that language. Instead, they talked about resurrection. They know what we know. Dead people don't get up and live again. It blew them away every bit as much as it would us. What I'd like to suggest then is that the existence of Christianity simply is not reasonably explained apart from the experience and the conviction that the story of Jesus did not end with his death, but rather his death began a new and more powerful phase of his life. Why do Christians believe this? The best way to approach an answer, I believe, is to take a moment again to understand what the first believers, what Paul and others thought about it. For them, resurrection meant something had happened to Jesus. Something that had an effect on how they viewed and understood him. Prior to the resurrection, they followed Jesus in the hope that he was the one chosen to bring about Israel's renewal. They thought he was going to be the Messiah, as you recall. They thought Jesus would be the fulfillment of Israel's hopes. After the resurrection, they followed Jesus as the Lord of all creation. And yet, and yet, Jesus was manifestly a failed Messiah. By any measure, the Jewish people would have looked at Jesus' life and seen him as a failure. He did not restore Israel to prosperity, safety, or freedom. He did not establish the rule of Torah as the rule for the people of Israel. He did not free the land from its oppressors. So why remember him?
Why write about him? Why would one give one's life for him? The New Testament authors needed to write because they needed to account for this paradoxical experience that God was somehow in this crucified one. What they needed to understand, of course, was how could this crucified one really be God's choice? The reason that question came up, the reason why they simply just didn't dismiss him as a failure, was somehow they experienced this crucified one as continuing somehow to be alive and with the power of God. And it's precisely because they had to put together their experience of this crucified one still lives that they had to make sense of how could the Messiah appear as a crucified one. If he had not been living, they simply would have concluded we were wrong and the crucified one is a failure. They weren't allowed to conclude he was a failure precisely because they experienced him as alive. So now they had to make sense of how could the crucified one be the Messiah? Resurrection, in other words, means not survival, not the immortality of the soul, not some eternal disembodied blissful state. Rather, it means bodily resurrection. Jesus went through death and came out the other side. But now, although physically alive, he is transformed and lives in a transformed way. The key point to see is that a crucified Messiah is a failure, a failed Messiah. It's that simple. Why would anyone continue to follow such a failure? Something dramatic had to happen and the claim that the early, Christian experience, early Christians experienced Jesus as the risen Lord makes more sense, it seems to me, than any of the other alternatives to understanding how did the car get across the river? How did they go from their Jewish understanding of what resurrection meant to the conviction that this failed Messiah was indeed the chosen one of, the, of God? That the first Christians believed that Jesus' body had been raised is beyond question. But what did that mean to them? Others before Christians believed that someone they had heard of had returned from the dead. But this did not create the dynamic that it did for the early disciples. The friends of Lazarus did not proclaim Lazarus as the Messiah. The friends of the widow of, uh, in name did not follow her son as the Messiah. In a word, Paul acknowledges that if Jesus is not resurrected, then the entire gospel is a lie. Jesus may have been a good teacher. He may have been a powerful prophet. But if he was not resurrected, he is at best a moral example like other teachers or prophets. He is, in other words, Saint Jesus. But Saint Jesus doesn't get us across the river either. Only the dynamic power of belief that Jesus has risen and inaugurated a new age, begun the end time, explains the actions and the words of the early Christians. Well, again, nice for the early Christians. What does the resurrection mean for us, my final point? Let me answer this in two parts. First, what the resurrection says about how we can understand God, and second, what the resurrection says about how we ought to and should live. First, what does the resurrection say about God? You probably have heard this story. Moses comes down from Sinai, and he announces to the Jewish people, I have some good news, I have some bad news. The good news is we have whittled the 40 commandments down to 10. The bad news is adultery is still in. 
or perhaps as another person put it, the trouble with Christianity is that everything Jesus is against, I like. Now, why create a God like that? You may say, I didn't create such a God. That's the way God is. However, the resurrection suggests that our conception of God is all too often false. I realize this is midterm week, and I appreciate you coming out in such a week, but I can't get, let you get away without a final quiz. What is the most common commandment in the Bible? What is the commandment most cited by Yahweh, by Jesus, by the prophets, by the apostles, by angels and patriarchs? What is the single most common commandment throughout the Bible? Be good? Don't sin? Be holy? Don't be immoral? No. The most frequent command in the Bible is, don't be afraid. Fear not. Now that may surprise you, but I would suggest to you, it is not a commandment we are any better at obeying than some of the others. Are you worried about some of your exams? Do you ever get anxious about term paper deadlines? Have you ever been afraid of being rejected before you approached someone? Ever been anxious about whether or not you'll get the right job? Get into the grad school of your choice? That you'll be able to deal with that problem in your family when you go home for the holidays? Every one of us has something about which we are ashamed, anxious, troubled. We all need someone to say to us, do not be afraid. You and I have grown up, or are growing up, in a world that breeds fear. We are afraid of being alone. We're afraid of being unloved. We are afraid of being unpopular. From our earliest days, we interact with other children, other teenagers, other adults. And we are afraid of looking stupid, of being left behind, of finishing last in some race that we didn't even sign up to run in. We worry, will we get the right job? Will we be any good at, at it if we get it? Will I marry the right person? Will my marriage wind up a disaster? And that's just a few of the fears. We all could name dozens of others. So do not be afraid is not an easy commandment to obey. Can we imagine actually living without fear and anxiety? To return to the point then about creating a God who makes all kinds of arbitrary rules that prevent me from enjoying life. We can project our fears, our anxieties, even our grudges onto God. But here is the really good news. The God who made the universe is the same God who raised Jesus from the dead. Believing in the bodily resurrection of Jesus is not just believing that Jesus rose from the dead, it is believing in the God who raised him. And belief in this God means that there really is nothing to fear. Now, learning this lesson can take a long time. I have several friends who, over the course of their life, have had to come to terms with chemical dependency. They have, in some cases, destroyed their careers and or their families in the process. As you may know, one of the essential steps in Alcoholics Anonymous in coming to terms with chemical addiction is to admit that one is helpless to resolve the problem oneself. People in such situations have often had to face truths about themselves 
that most of us would like to avoid. <coughs> Several of my friends are fellow priests and religious, and they have often told me that they had more of a conversion by participating in AA 12-step groups than in all the retreats and spiritual practices they engaged in as members of a religious community. 30, 40, 50 years into their adult lives, they still had to learn the lesson about God's love and their fears. So let us not presume that we really have learned the lesson that God is love and that each of us really is cherished by the God who made us. The gospel comes down to this, according to St. Paul. Either Jesus rose from the dead, or he didn't. If he didn't, then the whole Christian thing is a waste of time. But if God raised Jesus from the dead, then there is nothing ultimately to fear. For nothing can keep us from the love of God, not even death. As our fears are met at a deeper and deeper level throughout our lives, then we grow in freedom. We grow out of images of God as some bully or punitive rule maker who wants to squash my individuality or deny me my fun. Instead, we meet the God who wants us to have life without fear and without anxiety. <laughs> Gradually, we come to learn that the God who can be trusted with my death can be trusted with my exams, with my money, with my career, with my marriage. These things may not work out just as I have planned, but they will work out if we seek fidelity to the God who loves us. Finally, what does the resurrection say about my life? The usual focus of Easter is on one part of the early Christian claim. Jesus has been raised. Briefly, let's focus on the second part of that claim. The end time has begun. How do you and I live in the end time? How are we to live as if the final age has begun since Jesus has been raised? In the new age, the old promises are kept. God's promises. That the poor would hear the good news. That sinners will be forgiven. That men and women might live together as brothers and sisters. In God's time, relationships are not forgotten. The covenant is kept. People are invited into a new world where they live with one another as genuine equals not playing power games or trumping one another with their degrees or their incomes, not lording it over one another with the size of their homes or the niceness of their cars, not trying to prove their self-worth by their job titles or their bank accounts. To live in the end time is to live in a world where values are not disposable, but the gospel gets practiced. To live in the end time is to live in a world where people are not disposable, but they are loved and cherished. To live in the end time is to live in a world where Jesus really is the Lord of our lives. To understand the resurrection, we must see it as the resurrection of the one that God chose to be the Messiah. In the ministry of Jesus, in his suffering and death, the disciples discovered genuine goodness. To that goodness, the resurrection added power. If death on a cross had been the end, then the goodness which Christ embodied would have been beautiful, tragically beautiful, but it would not have been significant. But we are not talking about Spartacus a good man crucified by the Romans for leading a particular movement of liberation. We are not simply talking about the fate of a good man. The resurrection reversed the status of goodness. Instead of being pitiful, it was victorious.
it triumphed even over death. If Jesus' life and death had taught the disciples about love, his resurrection demonstrated that not even the worst that we can do to crucify the one who loves us can put an end to love. In a very personal sense, the disciples now were convinced that the love they had come to know in Jesus was backed up by the power of God who would not be defeated. For the early Christians, if the love of Christ was supported by such power, what harm could possibly come to them? This is what set them free to take up a way of life that was courageous, generous, and committed. Do you trust George Bush? How about John Kerry? Tonight, will you trust Peter Jennings, Tom Brokaw, Dan Rather? Who do you trust? We all trust someone or something. I trust the person who delivers my mail. I believe the reason my mailbox was empty this morning is because no one sent me a letter. Not that the mailman is holding out on me. A marriage can only work if a man and a woman trust each other. What makes some people trustworthy in our own eyes? We have all kinds of criteria. Perhaps the best one being personal experience or knowledge of a person as being trustworthy. But we all also depend on the testimony of others. Credentials displayed on an office wall or the assurance from third parties that this person can be relied upon. Criteria are necessary because trusting is serious business. An act of trust puts us in a vulnerable position. The opposite of trust is control. But there are some things we cannot control. We cannot control personal relationships. People require trust. To demand control over people is to destroy a relationship between people. What of humanity's relationship with God? Can we trust God? If so, what is our point of reference? What is it about God that invites me to trust? For us, as Christians, it is the experience of the Jewish people in general and of one Jew in particular, Jesus of Nazareth. Resurrection stands at the intersection of the present age and the age to come. Only this side of the experience can be narrated in history. He is not here. Of itself, that fact, the tomb is empty, is open to lots of interpretation. The early Christian community provided us with one interpretation. He is risen. It is the one explanation, I believe, that can account for how they lived after they made that claim. Can we believe that? Can we put our trust in that? If we cannot, then indeed, as Paul says, we are a pitiful people. If the first disciples were wrong, no, he is not here, but he is dead someplace else, then we have waged and lost. Then generation after generation of women and men have bet their lives and lost. All those lives we remember on this day that we call All Souls Day are lost. The essence of the event of Jesus, the whole point of the good news, comes down to this. Jesus' resurrection reveals to us what God is like. Jesus shows us that God is trustworthy. A life lived as Jesus lived it, with compassion, with mercy, in justice, in generous service, with integrity, in joy, and in hope, 
That is a life that God will save. A life caught up in the Spirit of God is a life that will not end. A life that spends itself building the foundations for people to live in communities of peace, justice, and love is a life that will ultimately conquer death. That is the message of the resurrection. We can trust in the God of life because of what God has done in the life of Jesus. In the face of suffering and death, and there is so much suffering and so many deaths, we have only the testimony of one resurrection. Is that enough to trust on? Is that enough on which to rest our hope? It was for the women who first went to the tomb. It was for that weak and troubled band of characters that became the strong and confident community of disciples. It was and has been enough for the millions who have staked their whole way of life on the promise that God will do for them what God has already done for Jesus. And so the church today continues because we trust and we hope in God based on the claim that Jesus is risen and is indeed the Lord of life. Thank you.